So, do you remember what we're talking about this uh, month? What? Amen. <laughs> that was that was escape. That was escape door. We're talking about raised by Christ. That we were raised by Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bible in Ephesians chapter two, verse one to ten. Amen. Hallelujah. When you find Ephesians 2, you give it a shout. When you find Ephesians 2 and 1, you give it a glory. Amen? Now, Ephesians is the New Testament right between Matthew and Revelation. Anybody home? Amen? Give it a shout, somebody. Amen? All right. We will read a few verses and then we'll read the rest. I want you to uh, keep your Bible over there. It says, And you ha he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature children of wrath, just as the others. Amen. Let's stop right there. Father God, you are awesome in power, great in love. Father, your mercies may be felt every day of our lives, Father. We worship and exalt your holy name. Father, we ask you to take our minds and our hearts captive to your presence, Father, and teach us the word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So as we close the series, Raised by Christ, with today's message title, To Be Seated in Heavenly Realms. So we were raised by Christ to be seated in heavenly realms. I hope you did have a glimpse of what it means to be raised from the dead and to be born again. Like we said many times here, when you come to Christ, you don't just get a shower and be clothed in new garments. The phrase born again means that you, as we read, were dead, but now you're alive. You know, you take religion apart and you, know, you take church names and doctrines apart and to be born again it's much more than just that you know going to church you know when we talked about the bible says that all things have passed away and everything is brand new from now on when you come to christ you know it doesn't mean that god just give you a nice scrub you know bleach you out put the most expensive heavenly perfume and now you look brand new no, 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 no. The Bible says that you are brand new. You are born again. Amen? To be born again means you just showed up in the kingdom of God. That you're just born. The day you truly give your heart to Jesus Christ, that day is the day of your birth. Now you're alive. Amen? We all are born... In our father Adam's, or Adam, therefore we were born to death because in Adam there is no life. In Adam, we were all stillborn. You know, nobody thinks, nobody talks about that. Because even though we walked, we talked, we ate, and we did all these things, we were stillborn. Because the, the, the life that God gave it to Adam in the beginning, he lost it. He lost it not because he disobeyed God. Not just because he disobeyed God, but because he didn't trust God. You know, I don't want to go back to, to, the, new, to, to the beginning and over there. But we all know that they decided to trust Satan more than, than trusting God. And they were deceived. Amen. 
We were born in sin and lived as the desires of the flesh and the human mind. The word of God says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So for those who remain in Adam will receive their salary, their reward, which is death. Now, I was reading this verse, and you know how much time, how many times I, heard, I, I, I read this verse, and how many times I said this verse here? So I'm sitting in my computer, and I looked, and I, there was a question in my mind, and a revelation by the Holy Spirit. Why does sins have salary and salvation is a gift? This is a rhetorical question. I just want you to answer in your mind. The Bible says that the salary of the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is salvation. So it, it's a gift. Let me tell you something. You cannot work for salvation. You can work for your flesh. You can work for sin and you get the wages of it. But for God, you don't work to get saved. You are just saved. It's a gift of God. Amen? So that was pretty cool. Raised by Christ to be seated in the heavenly realms. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. Chapter 1, uh, 1 to 3 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the salvation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So Paul is right, and he's saying, he's, just, he's already starting talking about heavenly places in some versions, in some versions, heavenly realm. Now, if you read this verse, and I, I was thinking about this, there is much doubt and division in this text by the lack of respect to the person of the Trinity and the lack of fear in the spirit of God's word. If you read the whole text, in some translations, we will say the word predestined. And there's confusion and division on that word. Not because the word itself, but because the lack of intimacy with God's love, grace, and will. Amen? And that bothered me for, for a long time in the church. Because every time I read that word predestined, it, it, it bothered me. It, it really, really bothered me. And it took many, many years as I was sitting right around that over there. When Pastor Clausen was not even preaching about this, she read a text. And right there the Holy Spirit talked to me. God didn't predestine some to have eternal life and some to be eternally condemned. I didn't want to go to, to, you know, to this, but I'll, I'll give you a very quick explanation. If you read the Bible in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Now, the secret to understand this uh, predestination is the word foreknew. Let's read Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who, pr who practice lawlessness, and here is the other word, never knew. For knew and never knew. To some it says for knew and to the others he says never knew. Do you want to be known by God? Then come to Jesus and obey his father. Amen. So I hope that takes the confused a little bit. Once you come to Christ, God then knows you. And because you come to Christ and he knows you, the Bible can says then that he foreknew you would accept. It's not that God predestined once to have eternal life and the others just, you know, 
to go to hell. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whoever loved, uh, uh, accepts him will have eternal life. It doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave his son to uh, save the one that was predestined to be saved. God gave us the free will. Amen. I just want to touch that. Maybe one day we'll go deep into it. If you do read Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, you will realize that it's about him. It's not about you and me. It's about his love. It's about his grace. It's about his will. He did everything. It's about God. It's about God's doing. It's about his grace and will for us, which is very good. You know, I have arguments about this a lot. About, you know, God being a dictator. Some people say that God is mean if we don't do what he wants. You know, we're going to burn in hell. We can argue as much as we want. But let me tell you something. In this book here, I mean, I have read a few times. And there's, I should read probably another thousand times seven and I'm still not going to know a lot about it. But everything that God says in this book, starting in Genesis and finishing Revelation, everything that God talks about you in this book is good. Actually, it's very good. Or should I say it's awesome. There is nothing in this book that says... Or any promise in this book that's bad for you. But it says here if you obey God because God only wants your good. I mean, how many parents we have here? How many times whatever you told your kids didn't sound good in their ears, but you meant good. You want their good. You don't want them to hit their faces in the wall like you and I did it, right? I told my kids the other day, let me tell you something. There is a feeling, there is a sentiment, there is something in me that you don't know. That you don't know how to feel. You don't know what it is. There is a worry. There is a passion. There is a love inside of me that you don't know. We can talk about it. We can teach you about it, but you don't know. You're only going to know the day that you become a parent. So when I say something, when I do things that I do, it's because as a parent, and just like Greg said, you, we know better. Who is a parent here that never made a mistake? You did everything right. Your life was perfect. Always good decisions. Actually, as a matter of fact, always the best decisions, right? No. So because I made a mistake on something, I'm going to tell them not to make the same mistake. Now, if you learn with your own mistakes, you are pretty smart, right? Right? If you don't commit the same mistake over and over, you're pretty smart. But let me tell you a secret. If you learn with the other mistake, you are wise, not just smart. If you see somebody making a mistake and you go like, oops, whew, I learned that. I'm not going to do it. That means you're a wise person. John 19.30 says, it is finished. When Jesus said that it is finished, it comes from the Greek word teleo or teleos, which means to bring to an end. It is accomplished, to complete, to finish. And the Greek construct of this sentence essentially means paid in full. It is an accounting term. That was used to say paid in full. That is why Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's in Mark 16, 19. You're going to understand why I'm saying that. His redemptive work was done once and for all. So when Jesus died at the cross, it was done. 
Everything that needed to be done for salvation, for you and I to have eternal life, it was done. And he said, it's painful. Everything that you and I owe to God, the debt that was against us, Jesus said, it's done, complete, paid in full. Hebrew 10.10, 10, our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand, Hebrews 10.12. In the temple there was no seat because the priest's work was never done. And so he could never sit down and rest. And the fact that he was finished for good, Hebrew 10.11. Since we are not saved by works, we too can rest in the redemptive work of Christ. And you're going to understand this in a little bit. We are not here working to be saved. Just as Jesus said, and it's done, it's finished. We can also rest in Jesus' redemptive work. That's why Jesus is now seated in and get ready for this. That's, you know, Jesus said it's done. So when you finish doing something, what do you do? No, you can answer that. You go to work and you finish your day of work, what do you do? And work more? Unless you're a wife, you keep working, cooking. No, I'm just kidding. Wives to rest. So once the work is done, you rest. How do you rest? Hello? Anybody home? You first, well, you, you just work and then you go home and you sleep? No, what do you do? You sit down. <laughs> you finish your work, you sit down to rest. Now, that's why Jesus is now seated. And get ready for this. There is a sit. There is a sit there for you. There is a sit us for us too. To sit right now. If you have already repented and trust in this high priest. There is a seat for you. Listen. Let's continue reading the text. We read 1 to 3. Let's go chapter, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 4. If you have Ephesians over there. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. So my Bible. And I hope you read the same thing in your Bible. My Bible says that I am. No, no. <clears throat> Actually, my Bible says that I will sit. Right? Right? Church? Come on. Anybody home? Knock, knock. Is that what the Bible says? That I will be seated? Come on, you need to wake up, church. It says that I am in the present as right now. Not that I will or that someday it's going to come. It says right here on the Bible. In verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Made, not will make, not one day, someday maybe. 
Come on. On a Sunday, Sunday school class for our kids. <laughs> I like that. Amen. The Bible says that we that let the kids come to me. When a person has repented and placed their trust in Christ, they have finished all that they need to do. Any good works we do are a result of being saved, not a way that we were saved. For it's written that we read. That is a gift of God. When we trusted in Christ, we were made alive together with Christ. In contrast to being in Adam where we were all dead, now in Christ we have all been made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Now we are told that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Meaning that like Christ, our works are done. We are not saved by works, but saved for works. But our works had nothing to do with our being saved. Amen? That is why we are as good as in heaven already. And we are essentially already seated there with Christ. Now, listen to this. Because God sees things, they are not yet as though they already are. Because in His presence, future already is. So the things on earth that is not yet, they already are. I love playing with words. Let me do this a little slower. Listen. I got lost. Because God sees things that are not yet as though they already are. You, you, got, that, you got that part? You understood, right? Okay, okay. Be, listen, listen, this is... Because in His presence, it, where God is, future already is. That, that's come the explanation. Show, so, the things on earth that is not yet, they already are. Do you, do you get this? So you are seated on a black chair right now in Lowell out of all places. And to make things better on 152 Appleton Street. People might say, does anything good come out of Appleton Street? And I say, heck yeah, a lot of things. But as God sees you now in his presence, where there is no time, he sees you seated with Christ in heaven right now. If you have repented and trust in Christ, then you are right now, as scripture says, seated with Christ. And you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's in Ephesians 2.19. Let me tell you something. You are no longer strangers. You are no longer aliens. You are no longer dead, but you are alive and you are part of God's family. And you are seated with fellow believers. How great is that? Come on. Can we even fathom the idea that we are now in God's presence seated with Jesus Christ in heaven? Can we rest in that knowledge? Even though you might not completely understand. But can you rest? By knowing that God sees you right now seated with his begotten son, Jesus Christ, in heavenly places where it's pretty perfect over there. If we rest in that, we can rest from trying to add works to our salvation. 
because Jesus accomplished what we could not. He died so we might live. That's why it means to be ready, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So we don't work to be saved, but we are saved to do works. So that we can help others to come and sit with us in heavenly places. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something very important before I finish. There are people and there are people in church. There are, there are visitors and there are the friends of God and then there is the family of God. There are friends of God and there are family of God. I want to use somebody here. I want to say, Luz, come over here. And Mark, come over here. You stand beside, beside him over there, looking at that wall over there. Beside. You, you know what's beside? Yeah, it's right there. All right, so let's pretend I'm going to choose Luz because he's the pretty one and I'm pretty. So he's my son. He's my wife's and my son. Okay? Now, Mark, you're only a friend. Actually, a good friend of the family. So Mark is not my son. This is my son. So I'm here minding my own business. And they're both come to me and said, you know, you say, Daddy, I need money. And he says, my friend, I need money. So I take my wallet. Only one, one money here. So $10. Now they both need, they both need money. But this guy is my son. But this guy is my good friend. They, need, they both need $10. Who am I going to give this $10 for? I will give the $10 to my son. And I'm going to tell you I'm sorry. Try it next time. You got $10 today. You may be seated. I'm sorry, I only had $10. So I'm going to tell you right now, who would you rather be, a friend of God or a son and daughter of God? I want to invite you to stand up.